Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick Curtis, your host and chief monkey, and this is the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Join me as I talk to some of the community's most successful and inspirational members to gain valuable insight into different career paths and life in general. Let's get to it. In this episode, member Bull-Ish shares how he built up a robust internship profile and networked aggressively throughout his undergraduate studies to help him break into an elite boutique investment bank from a complete non-target with a 3.4 GPA. How he was able to secure an offer even after bombing multiple investment banking super days, and what happened when he had to leave unexpectedly from his analyst stint. Enjoy. All right, member Bull Dash Ish, thank you for joining the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Patrick. So it'd be great if you could just give the listeners a quick summary. Sure. So uh, a brief one-on-one background on on what I've done, where I've been. Uh, a foreigner uh, from Central South America moved to California when I was approximately fifteen, sixteen to finish up high school and really pursue a higher education in the U.S. Um, You know, spent the majority of my time in California, went to a non-target school in Southern California, a private institution, pretty much a a no-name school. Mm -hmm. Uh, We placed a few individuals into banking, primarily in the West Coast and a few on the East Coast, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's been very rare. you know, happy to add more color wherever necessary. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, and then so you um, you basically worked in banking for a couple of years now. Can you just, how long have you been doing that now? Yeah, so, you know, on and off, I would say collectively a year, and that's not including any internships, but if you consolidate my, uh, you know, summer analyst roles and my co-op uh, analyst positions throughout school, I would say approximately four or five years of great. experience. Great. So let's go back to kind of undergrad is when you kind of started applying to schools, um, did you even know what banking was? Like I'm talking college is like, did you know what banking was or when did you kind of first figure out like finance and, and investment banking was something that was interesting to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I had no idea what investment banking or private equity or venture capital were. Um, Originally, I wanted to major in business admin and keep it very broad. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I come from a lineage of men in my family that have pursued business admin degrees, so it made sense for me. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to get myself into. And, you know, as I progressed through my professional development, gained some more hands-on experience, um, you know, I was exposed uh, to investment banking and private equity more through osmosis and more organically. That was like at undergrad. Did you have like a friend telling you about it or was it like um, people, anybody on campus or how did, do you remember exactly like when you were like, oh, that's interesting? Sure. You know, I I think pop culture played a a big part in that. What I mean by that is, you know, we all hear about (laughs) Wolf of Wall Street Street (laughs) and all the other movies that are are very cache and really showcase that Wall Street culture. Uh Um, So I, I was intrigued and interested in finding out more in terms of what the rules entailed and what you could do. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was always of interest, but it wasn't until uh, I spoke to a few more people and really got uh, my first internship that I started learning more about the actual role and and the industry. So let's talk about that first internship. How did you, you know, what year were you in school? Were you like a sophomore, freshman? Were you, when did you kind of start looking for any sort of finance internship? Yeah. So, um, transitioning from high school into college uh, I thought it was it was pretty important it would give me a competitive advantage to have an internship under my belt and I completed a, a very random internship right it was with the International Trade Development Center in uh, San Francisco uh, not what I wanted to do at all but I think it was it was my first exposure into a business environment um, so did that and I think you know more broadly, Coming from a non-target school, it's always important to have those building blocks of prior internships that perhaps don't have the best branding, but at least give you some marketing on the CV. You know, it's um, interesting so to me. It. It's interesting to me that you knew that, but then you still end up going to a non-target, like a complete non-target. 
So like, it's interesting right. to me that you like had that. that insight, but yet you were, I guess at the time when you were going in, you didn't know what investment banking was. So you didn't know that it was going to be harder coming from there. So uh, it was more like you just, you just had the advice from somebody um, that internships were important, I guess. Yes, I, I think I agree with your point. And more than anything, I wasn't fully aware of how important branding and pedigree was, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in investment banking. Yep. And that's something I, I realized later. Well, hopefully less so in the future. But okay, so you you basically um, had something coming into school. So then tell me about so un, kind of an unrelated internship. Then you start learning about banking. Tell me about the next kind of internship. How did that process go? Can you tell me how you reached out to people? How were you like sourcing that? Sure. Um, so I think I'll take a step back and I'll give you my rationale into recruiting before mm -hmm. actually telling you about the process. Sure. Um, my objective was to get the best possible internship that fell within the realm of possibilities given my background. Um, so in short, you know, used a variety of, of resources available to me through school. Uh, I think career shift, handshake, uh, on-site recruiting and on-campus recruiting, uh, and landed uh, a real estate, I, I guess, investor relations intern position. Mm -hmm. Um where I was going to school in Southern California. Again, it was not so related to do full time, but it gave me a different, uh, I guess, framework to work with in, in terms of understanding what the industry and landscape was and what the possibilities were with a, a finance degree. Um, so that was my second internship. Really moving forward, I'm happy to discuss any of the roles I've held throughout school, but really the, the objective was every, every internship that I had after that, after the prior one, had to be uh, better than the previous one, right? In whatever capacity, whether it be a better brand name, a better role, more responsibilities. Uh, I just wanted to continue building that branding, getting uh, that professional development as uh, quickly as possible. Was there was there something that you kind of put more emphasis on in terms of like skill development over brand? And should kids think about like on, when they're looking at internships in terms of what to get? Like, should it be something where they're taking an internship that has like better skill building, but maybe a lower brand versus like getting placed in back office at like a bulge bracket. <laughs> like what, should, how should they sure. think about that? How should they think about that? Um, here's my impression and please take it with a, with a grain of salt. I think branding is everything or at least through what I've experienced. And to your point, it starts becoming less important as you progress throughout your career. But I think throughout undergrad, the most important thing is branding. And at the end of the day, right, when you go to Super Days and you have these uh, conversations via phone, it's all about the way you sell yourself. You can, I think, pivot and transform any experience you've had uh, to, your, to your benefit. Got it. So just having that brand on there, you can kind of, if it's an internship at least, you can kind of twist it a little bit to be a little bit more applicable to whatever role you're applying to in terms of just speaking to your skills and stuff like that and what you're sure. exposed to. Okay, that's fair. Um, so you um, had internships basically every summer, it sounds like, going through school. And can you tell me a little bit about that whole process, like how you approached this, like these searches? Yeah, yeah. So to your point, yes, pretty much held a uh, summer analyst role ever since freshman year, mm -hmm. and I did a variety of co-ops uh, beginning sophomore year. So I think it was a twofold. One, I wanted to continue that professional development. And number two, I was sustaining myself throughout college. So the economic benefit was uh, very important. But really, the, the way I thought about approaching these opportunities was, one, making sure I was as polished as possible on every front, right? On the knowledge front, on the uh, narrative story front, on really having everything in my CV make sense for the role that I was applying for. I think preparation is key in any role that you're gonna be pursuing. Uh, number two, uh, I think relationship building has served me very well, especially coming from non-target and coming from a, I guess, different pedigree. Um, relationship building has made a difference in those final moment decisions. Got it. In terms of like um, specifically the the actual, I guess, tactics you used for these internships, sure. was it, you said some of it was like hand, through Handshake on campus, but like the ones you ended up actually landing, what, what, what was the source of those like in each year? 
I'd, I'd be curious yeah, to hear, was it like, it. was it like one, like I a network about, or yeah. I would say about 80 to 70% of the opportunities that I landed was through networking. And it all began with anything from, you know, cold call, reaching out via email and asking someone to grab coffee. And really once you have them on the phone or once you're in front of them during a coffee meeting, uh, it's really just about selling yourself, creating a, a good relationship. And that more often than not led to me securing an internship. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to note is that you have to showcase how competent you are and how capable you are of performing within the role. Um, but again, I, I really want to stress that relationship building and differ differentiating yourself from other candidates. How did you prepare for those coffee chats, if, if at all? Is it just something knowing your story and the resume? Or like, how did you, pr did you practice that in any way? Yeah, so more importantly, it was getting my story and my narrative right. Knowing every single detail about what I had done, why I had taken up certain roles, um, what I was looking for in my next role, I think that's important because it, it gives the person you're speaking to more confidence and bringing you on board, if that's the case. And item number two is being pretty well versed on uh, the firm that of the person you're speaking with or understanding their background and really coming to, to that meeting or hopping on the phone with these thoughtful questions or at least having a framework that you're going to follow to, to have these conversations. Yeah, I think it's really underrated than the, the types of questions you ask to see how knowledge you can really show your knowledge just by the types of questions you ask. Instead of something generic you could look up on Google, you're actually asking something right. that's more interesting and detailed. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's I think that's a great point that people should take to heart. Like when you get these coffee chats, don't waste them asking stuff you could look up on your on your own. You know, ask them. Exactly. You know, you, every question should be pointed and interesting. So, anyways, so you. Um, you kind of had a lot of these coffee chats. You kind of felt comfortable. Was it something you were always comfortable with, kind of networking and talking with people? Was it something that you got better better at over time? Um, or how, how did that develop for you? Sure. You know, being a foreigner and having lived in so many cities and states here in the U.S., uh, I, I've had to learn how to become adaptable very quickly, mm -hmm. you know, adapt to new cultures, new environments, new cities. And I think that has pushed me into feeling more comfortable and in interacting with a variety of people from different backgrounds that I have no relationship with. Mm -hmm. um, on a separate note, I think it is a skill that you can acquire and it's something that, that you improve on as you continue having these coffee chats and having these conversations. You you get better incrementally every time. Yeah, no, I, I think for sure. And do you, did you do any practice before that or did you just get better naturally through it? Like, did you do mock interviews with a friend or anything like that or with a mentor? I didn't do any mock interviews. I can see how there would be benefit in doing that. I took the other approach, I guess you would say, and really dove into it head on, mm -hmm. um, made many mistakes initially, and I think I learned from them very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the sooner um, undergraduate students take that leap and really go after these conversations and these coffee chats, uh, the quicker they are going to learn from the mistakes that they may make. I, I think there's some value in um, making these mistakes yourself as opposed to hearing someone else tell you uh, what could happen if you do X, Y, Z. Got it. So you're, let's talk a little bit about the banking specific internship and that whole process. So for, was it your junior year? Like when, when were they recruiting? Do I assume junior year, early junior year, or even in the summer before your junior year? Were they kind of, um, was the process kicking off? How did you kind of get yourself from a non-target? You had been networking, I assume, but how did you kind of get even in, land the interview there because i think a lot of sure. a lot of kids struggle to even get in the door like get the initial first round you know what i mean <laughs> yes and uh to that point i had been applying to all the major banks since freshman or sophomore year and had got so many you know after careful consideration emails that you know i thought it was more important to continue developing that expertise and putting more things on my cv mm -hmm. so come junior year um, I had an interview with uh, a bulge bracket bank for a commercial banking role in San Francisco. Uh, I performed very poorly. I didn't, I had no idea how to prepare. I didn't know anything about technicals. I hadn't even taken my first upper division finance course. So you can imagine that was a complete <laughs> disaster. Um, what I think I did well was uh, showing awareness, maturity, 
and, and being prepared on the more qualitative side. Mm-hmm. Um, so the team I spoke to in, in San Francisco liked me so much that they referred me to a team in New York that was actually hiring. That opportunity came to me probably a month after I had that initial Super Day with the group in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I spent a lot of, of time in, prep, in, in preparing, right? I spent, I locked myself in in my apartment during the weekends and I, I would spend eight to 10 hours in there going over technicals and reading up on behavioral interview questions. So I think the preparation the second time around was there. Yep. Um, I think I, I did a pretty good job in knowing my narrative inside out and really being able to sell myself well. Um, so when that opportunity in New York came around, I secured a summer analyst role in New York. Um, and I think that was a major inflection point in me continuing to to build my career in, in finance and more so doing doing that in the East Coast. Okay, so tell me a little bit about specifically that that uh, actual super day for that East Coast firm. Was it um, unexpected? Did you were you like super ready for the technicals and you got almost nothing? Or tell me about that that whole story. Was it tough? Yes, yeah, it was very tough. Um, I think it's always difficult for a non-target kid to pitch a story and tell someone else why you're as competent as a Harvard, Yale, Wharton kid uh, mm-hmm. who's equally as competent as you are, if not more. Uh, but I think what made a difference this, this time around was I really took all the learning experiences from my first Super Day in San Francisco and understood how important it was to be fully prepared when it came to tacticals. Mm-hmm. Um I think that was it, right? There, there's nothing else I can tell you but preparation. And I'm a, I'm a big believer in uh, some of these opportunities are partially luck, right? I yep. mean, the fact that I did well and showcase, showcased my abilities and got a referral from the team in NASA to New York, uh, I think that was the element that it was a, a little fortunate for me. And you, the, the rest of it was preparation. Was there anything unexpected at the interview? Any unexpected questions that kind of caught you off guard that you had to kind of work around? Not that I can think of. Nothing mm-hmm. out of the, the ordinary. ordinary. I yep. think the first time around when you hear, uh, you know, perform a debt analysis on company XYZ and you've never taken an upper division finance course and you know nothing about technicals, right. that could be daunting. Um, but nothing that I can think of for the other Super Day in New York. Okay, quick question. Did you ever get any benefit from like these um, underrepresented kind of associations since you were an international student, underrepresented minority in finance? Did that ever help you? Because it sounds like you had this super data bulge bracket. They really liked you. So that, that ended up kind of getting you that crucial summer internship. Was that, did that have sure. anything to do with um, any of these programs? No. You know, I never knew about diversity recruitment. I never Mm -hmm. leveraged that to to my advantage. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's something I would encourage others to do. It's really just another avenue to break in. Yeah. Uh, But I I never did that myself. I I think part of that was, you know, maybe pride or maybe ego. But (laughs) I, when I landed an internship, I wanted to know that that was fully as a result of my preparation, my competency and my abilities. I didn't want to feel uh, like anything was was handed off to me. So you knew about them. You just were. You were just kind of like, ah, I'm not going to do that because I already have connections or I'm already doing okay. Or I'm, I'm just surprised because coming from a non-target, I'd assume you'd want to pull every lever you have, any potential advantage. Right, and it wasn't until after my summer at the PB that I learned about all these diversity programs. Got it. Got it. Uh, but even then, I I didn't pursue any of those avenues. Uh, even after my summer there and recruiting for full time. Cool. Okay. So then you're, you're at this internship. How was it? Was it, uh, you know, you're in New York now. Is it, uh, stressful, long hours, short hours, what you expected? What, what was that like? Sure. I, you know, it was so funny. I remember getting to New York and calling my family immediately, I think day one, day two. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm actually, (laughs) I'm going back to California. It's very daunting getting to a new city and especially New York. It's, it's huge, right? And there's so many people, so much traffic, so many things happening here yeah. that it was a big culture shock for me being there. Uh, but I think overall, my experience was fantastic. I worked with very intelligent people, uh, learned a lot, uh, started building on my professional network um, here in New York, um, and built a lot of good friendships throughout throughout my time there. 
Nice, nice. And, 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 and sorry, go ahead. Yeah, in terms of, of workload, I was going to comment on that. The hours weren't uh, were anything that I, I wasn't able to manage. On average, they were anywhere between 55 and 65. Not too so bad. within a corporate strategy uh, group, really an internal consulting group focused on, focusing on um, any strategic initiative coming from senior leadership and C-level insights. Can you tell me the type of work that that group is corporate? Because it's it's a little bit less well known. Corporate strategy is kind of a vague thing. So when senior, when you say come kind of initiatives from senior management, what can you give like a couple examples of the type of stuff you'd be working on? Yeah, I have to do so. Um, so I can speak on one of the projects I worked on was deploying a new a new technology tool firm wide, mm-hmm. and there is a lot of of strategic planning and communicating with a variety of departments in order to better manage the change and the new deployment of technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's there's a lot of cross-collaboration between departments. Uh, Many days spent, uh, I guess, planning and identifying what the costs are going to be in the new tool that's going to be deployed. Yep. Um, Another one was a firm-wide documentation a strategic initiative where it was really standardizing and automating all all the documentation project or I'm sorry all the documentation initiatives across all the sub verticals within the bank. So, so this is really investment banking. This really sounds more like internal consulting. It doesn't really sound like investment bank. You're at an investment bank, but it's like internal consulting, right? Correct. Yeah. So, no, that's exactly it. So I was so, working at a BB, but within the internal consulting capacity. So did you feel like that put you at a disadvantage when it came to recruiting for pure IB um, in, you know, your senior, was it your, I guess, or after the, after the internship, I assume you got, I assume you got an offer for full time or no. I did receive an offer for, for full time. And I think that's in part what I used to, to leverage yeah. um, securing these first rounds and super days. But to your point, the only disadvantage that I felt I had was really, uh, I guess, lacking that quantitative skill set that you would develop during an investment banking internship. Mm -hmm. But what I think recruiters and and people at other firms uh, appreciated was the diversity in the background, right? I think consulting and uh, partaking on some of these specialized projects gives you a more Mm -hmm. macro, high-level strategic view on Mm -hmm. business and overall operations. Well, you also had a ton Um, of internships, too. You had, like, a huge track record by that point, right? And then you also speak well, so it's, like, a huge thing. Like, you speak well, you can tell a good story, so it's (laughs) it's probably like, oh, okay, you know? Um, So that helps, too. Right, and I think I, on the more quanti- quantitative side, I used some of the internships that I had to communicate that narrative, right? I'd done internships across uh, venture capital, mm-hmm. asset management. Uh, I felt a little bit well-versed in that area to where I could communicate having that skill set, uh, you know, aside from not receiving it here during this internship. Yeah, and you'd polished up your technicals enough where if they actually challenged you on it, you'd probably be fine. Yeah, I did. Yeah, so, okay, so you secure the offer, which is key, and you're kind of coming into senior year. How do you think about that? Did they have, is it an exploding offer? How was that a stressful time? Did you um, immediately start trying to shop the offer knowing you wanted to be in um, more pure IB or how did that happen? Yeah. So I would say about a month before my internship was over, Mm -hmm. I already knew that I I wanted to pursue investment banking. Mm -hmm. And I had a variety of coffee chats and conversations with people in New York, communicated my interest in investment banking. By then, uh, I was pretty well versed in terms of recruiting timeline. So I started planting seeds everywhere I could, having these conversations and preparing for full-time recruiting. Uh, which would happen approximately in September, October, and November. Um, so really, the minute I got back to, uh, when I got back to California from being in New York, I I kept the momentum. I kept sending emails out. Um, I sent over 350 emails across a variety of different banks, you know, Bulge Bracket, Metal Market, Lee Boutique. I shopped everything. Um and ultimately, with you know the those 350 emails plus, I ended up landing four super days out of that. And uh, let me ask you a question. So, w- did you have a lot of time to do that? Because it sounds like you had been planting the seeds before your internship ended, which was really smart because you knew you were going to be moving out of New York, right? And so, were you right. were you planting those seeds mostly um, back you know back west coast, or you know were you planting them everywhere? I was planning them everywhere, primarily yep. in California and New York. I yep. think 
uh, geography has to tie into your narrative, meaning, you know, hey, went to school in California, would love to do investment banking in California, right. or alternatively, had a summer internship in New York, would love to stay here in New York. Got it. Okay, so uh, you're... Geography is... Yeah, so you're doing you're doing all that, and you're like, see, so you, once you get the offer, when like, tell me the timeline. Like, when did you actually start landing Super Days, and how long did you have to either accept or turn down the offer? Yeah, so I believe I had a month, month and a half to respond to the offer. Okay, from the BB in New York, which that that put a lot of stress on the recruiting process from my end, but I think it, it's, it was a pro and con, right? Some firms responded saying, Hey, that's going to be too short of a notice for us. We're not going to be able to make that timeline. And other banks were more inclined to uh, give me an accelerated process to get a, a decision as quickly as possible. The first super day I had came in, uh, I believe it was late August or beginning of September. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'd spoken to a variety of people at the firm, so I didn't even do a first round or, or a second round. It was straight to super day. Yep. Um, so I was already in, in fall semester and I flew out to New York, had the super day. Um, I think that was another failed attempt. It was, it was a lot more brutal than I expected it to be. And, some of the technicals I wasn't fully prepared for, right? I think that was my first exposure to an investment banking super day. Tell me, it tell me about that. Work. What, what, what shocked you about it? What surprised you? Yeah, I, what surprised me was how well prepared you had to be for macroeconomics. Uh, you know, at, at the time, I didn't. I mean, I generally knew what was happening with unemployment or other geopolitical events, but uh, I think they were very. Uh, directed and specific about the macroeconomic questions they asked me to get a better understanding of how well versed I was. Mm -hmm. uh, so I filled that part, and I'd been focusing more on the corporate finance side, which uh, led me to oversee these more macroeconomic topics that might be covered during an inter interview. So, like, they were like asking about interest rate policy, the Fed, and like see if you could talk about that and how comfortable you are in like macroeconomic right, so trends and stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the questions were really, you know, what do you know? So, you, you know, we have two topics, unemployment or oil. I, I know I knew nothing about oil at the time, so I went with unemployment, and it was very specific, right? Well, what's the unemployment rate right now? How has it been historically? What does that mean for the economy? Uh, all questions that I wasn't prepared for, and they caught me off guard. Yeah, it's interesting. So had you taken macroeconomics or an advanced macro course? I, I took two e two econ courses. I, I took macro and micro. Yeah, I took them fr freshman year, so they weren't they're were rusty. Uh, fresh, <laughs> they were rusty, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and I had only started reading, I guess, the Wall Street Journal about three or four weeks prior to the mm. Super Days. Yeah, I think that's something that you have to do consistently throughout the year in order to to fully understand everything that's happening in the market and totally. uh, get a better feel for the overall landscape. Yeah, and just the history, right? Just knowing kind of how right. things have trended in the past, the financial, having a good, even even though you were super young when the financial crisis happened, kind of that whole story around that, what happened, being able to explain that, I think is, is key. Just to like to appreciate the history of, of finance and the markets and stuff, I think is. I agree. Yeah, that's key. Okay, cool. So that's interesting. So it was your first kind of super day for pure IB kind of was harder than you thought it would be how polished you had to be it was it was kind of a shock because you're pretty polished on the behaviorals on the fit clearly but it was again the technicals again kind of got you um right so, so at this point are you just like cramming even harder you're learning macro now <laughs> you're going back to the macro text it was like what's happening you go back to you go back home tail between your legs how do you feel what's going on you're thinking man i'm just gonna have to take this uh corporate strategy job is that what your thought is right Right. So in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, that's that. At least I got to, to interview and I think I, I have to start getting prepared to sign my offer. Right. But mm -hmm. something inside of me really wanted to keep wanted to, to continue pursuing investment banking. And, you know, I, I knew that now that I had traction, I had received one super day. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that momentum and really that opportunity of me being able to, to land another super day. So, uh, I, again, you know, that those weekends and those afternoons when I had no homework and no internships to go to, I would lock myself in my room for hours and hours and read everything, anything macro, continue brushing up on the corporate finance 
uh, technicals and really continuing to hone in on my narrative. Yep. Um, and, you know, after that, I did receive three other Super Days. Um, you know, one of them, I, I didn't... Did that surprise I, you or did I you feel like that was coming? It was surprising. I didn't think I would receive three more Super Days, especially... Mm -hmm. You know, they were all with very reputable firms. Can I say uh, why you was... probably got three more Super Days? <laughs> why I think you got why three? I... I think you got it because you had an exploding offer. I think it's a huge psychological, and it's a huge advantage. Having that having I... that exploding offer is just huge because everyone's like, oh, you already have an offer. So it's like you're the, you're, you're like almost a hot commodity, right? <laughs> They're like, I want to get that yeah. guy. He already has an offer. Um, so, okay. I, I would agree with that. I think that that definitely helped out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I think I was being very thoughtful in the emails I was sending out yeah. in terms of how they were being framed. They were very short, straight to the point. Tell me what you said. Tell me kind of what you said in those. Was it like, Hey, you know, really love your firm, but you know, I have, I have an exploding offer, you know, within a few weeks was hoping we could maybe figure something out or how, how did you kind of phrase it? If you remember? Yeah, it was something, it was something to the effect of high X, Y, Z. Uh, I recently spent my summer in New York working for Bank XYZ mm -hmm. within the XYZ group, and I'm very interested in exploring opportunities within your firm. Would you be willing to chat at some point? So you didn't make mention uh, of the exploding offer or anything like that in, initially? I didn't. That that was something I would communicate uh, during the phone conversation, but I think – Got it. Uh, I, I don't know. I perceived it I, as it was almost implied by saying I spent the summer out there, but I did clarify that during all the calls I had. Yeah, they might have expected on some of those emails that like, you didn't get an offer back or something, and you're like scrambling, and then you get on the call and you're like, "Oh no, I have an offer," and then it's all of a sudden your your um, your perceived status jumps probably way up. Sure, that. you know what? I just remembered uh, a lot of the HR contacts uh, replied two or three three emails after saying, "Hey." Uh, did you receive a return offer for your summer internship yeah, before totally. even hopping on the, on the phone with it? Totally. It's like, it, that's, that's what makes it, if you don't get that return offer, that's what makes it super, super tough. And sometimes there's, it's right. not, it's, sometimes it's out of your control. Sometimes just, they don't make any offers or they make very few offers. So, um, sure. just real shout out. There's a, in the company database, there are percentage of interns receiving offer stats per comp by company. So if you have two offers for internships and you're want to make sure you're going in there, equal or similar in terms of, you know, um, pedigree in terms of uh, opportunity, you should look at uh, return offer rates to see which one you should take. Um, right. Just a heads up to, to the listeners. Okay, so you're, you're basically um, three super days. So tell me, is this like, is it coming up to the date where you have to get this, accept this role? Or like, is it? What's what's your what's going through your process, uh, your mind? Or is it all accelerated? How did that work? Yeah, the, all of them after that were accelerated, meaning they were about a week in length mm -hmm. from initial screening to Super Day to having a decision. Yep. Um, I can't remember the exact dates, but I, I can tell you I extended my offer at the BB um, for a few weeks. And that, that was actually just in line with all the other interviews I had. Um, because what I wanted to prevent, I, I didn't want to be in a position where I had to accept and there's another super day and I would be put in a position where I had to renege or do something that, you know, I would regret down the road. Were you nervous um, when you I, tried to do the BB push back at all? When you tried to do that, did they, did they were like, eh, fine. Like you can have two more weeks or was it, was it like, Oh yeah, take your time. It's always a difficult conversation, right? Because uh, I think it's no secret that they know what you're doing. Why yeah. they know what you're doing, right? Why else would you turn down a return offer out of BB in New York when you're from a non non target in California? Right. I think that's absurd. It makes no sense. And they they were aware of what was going on behind the scenes, but it's one of those untold secrets, right? That uh, great, we're going to go ahead and extend that for you. But I think another element that added to that difficulty was. You know, I, I know some of the target schools have uh, a, a more structured career development and, and recruitment office where they they support you in extending uh, some of the offers, right? Yeah. Um, there's some sort of protection. where You I, had to do it yourself. <laughs> I had to do that myself, right? <laughs> Jeez, on your um, own. So, yeah, I would think that's nerve wracking because you're thinking, man, I may lose my offer or something it, what if yeah it completely is right and you you know you speak to some of the other interns that received return offers and are, are doing the same thing you are and you start hearing rumors about 
so and so got his offer pulled because he extended, and, and you start panicking, right? Like, here's this great opportunity that you want, but it's not exactly what you want. Do you settle for that and just call it a day and get throughout senior year just with an offer already secured, or do you continue pursuing what you really want and run the risk of having nothing at the end of the day? Or do you accept and then renege? I mean, it's, or accept and renege. It's right? it's a big <laughs> it's a big debate on the on the site actually. Oftentimes, is people like you don't want to burn bridges. There was actually a guy who was a, uh, I think a VP or a principal came on the site and said he called up a person had accepted and then like last second they reneged. He called yeah. up the kid's future bank. Somehow he found out where the kid was going and the kid ended up with no oh, offers. No. Like total hor- horrible <laughs> story. People were so pit- the the community was very angry about that one, um, rightly so. I think right. you know. Um, anyways, point is, um, it, it's a tough it's a tough thing. I think if you're straight with the bank, I think if if you do it in the right tone, in the right way, and you're not arrogant about it, and you're, you're appreciative, I think you can typically. I think most places will be reasonable. Um, sure. Yeah, especially if they really want you back. You know. And, and there's so many variables that go into that, right? How well did you perform throughout your summer right. there? How how strong your relationships how it, there? Yeah, sure. How yeah. how good is the rapport that you have with the people? And mm-hmm. again, to your point, the delivery is is very important. You have to do it in a humble, regretful way. But uh, there is no right or wrong answer. It's just really committing to what you think is best for your career. But I think a lot of professionals understand that. When you're conflicted between opportunity A and opportunity B, you have to do what's best for you because I think some of these BBs and EBs and middle market banks, are you're replaceable, right? Especially as an analyst, they're not going to crumble. They're not going to stop making revenue. They're going to be okay if they have to find another analyst. Now, tell, um, me, tell me this. When you kind of went back to the Bulge Bracket Bank and you had to write that email or make that call, well, yeah, first off, did you make it email or call? was it a call Like which, for that? Yeah. Sure. I, I think because of my values, I, I always like to address things head on and I want to be very respectful and manage it as carefully as possible. So I called uh, the two HR contacts various Smart. times throughout the week. I think they were swamped and they were traveling. So wasn't able to connect to them via phone, uh, which was almost beneficial to me because that would prevent them from asking any more probing questions. And I was just able to craft an email, send that off to them, got a reply. And I think Overall, it was well well received, um, with a little pushback, right? I, I think no matter how you deliver it, there's always going to be some apprehension about people extending. And but did you uh, did you it, say it along the lines of like you know I'm still I was hoping you could um, give me a few more weeks for this. It's, it's it's a difficult decision in terms of location. Like, did you use the location as a reason to delay, or what? Did you, what were you using? Like you, you weren't like, hey, I'm interviewing at all these other super days. <laughs> Can you give me some time? Right? You obviously didn't say that. But to tell me kind of what you used or kind of the, the, the phrasing, because I think that could be helpful for a lot of people who are in a similar boat sure. but are really nervous. In this scenario, I think geography worked to my advantage. Yeah. It, it was a very easy sell. Right? That's exactly California, what I was going to say. New York, yeah, all, my, all my family is either in California or, you know, uh, Mexico City. So it was a very easy sell on that front. I I didn't have to include anything else in there, but I would say for anyone considering writing these emails or having these conversations, um, just be aware and have a good understanding of what your strongest argument would be and leverage that. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that makes a lot. I would, I was going to say you must have used geography. (laughs) Geography, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, great. So these, tell me about these three super days. Um, anything unexpected, yeah, but, anything kind of surprising? Did you all of a sudden start landing offers? What happened? <laughs> yeah. So all the super days with the exception to the final one, I bombed them all, meaning I did mm-hmm. very poorly. And I think it was a combination of things, right? I, I prepared, 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 knew all the technicals, was very comfortable with the behaviorals, but I can give you one example. One of the, the EBs that, uh, that I was interviewing for. EB um, being Elite, the Elite Boutique Investment Bank, yeah, for those oh, who don't know. Yep, go ahead, yep. Right, Elite, Elite Boutique. Mm-hmm. And it was only there was only one role, and it was only two, inter- there were two people interviewing at the Super Day, myself, one other individual. Uh, the other individual, um, you know, spent his summer at J.P. Morgan within the M&A group. And immediately, my my heart dropped, right? I'm like, well, here's this guy who's already done M&A at a 
pretty reputable bank, and here I am, a non-target with no investment banking experience. And I almost psyched myself out, right? I almost you know, I started getting very nervous and sweaty, and I think that had a, a detrimental impact on my interviews. Uh, mm-hmm. Not to mention, I think the interviews themselves were very tough. Um, but that uncertainty and that, I guess you could call it a, a lack of confidence, really had a detrimental impact on, on my performance. Do you think that was because it was only one other person and you kind of you felt really like you were being contrasted against that one other person with a stronger background? Do you feel like Absolutely. it would like when you walked in and you met this guy or girl and it was like, oh, no, um, <laughs> was it like it was like that almost like it was immediately you were defeated? It was interesting because the, the other person was just as nervous as I was, if not more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the minute I heard J.P. Morgan, M&A, and then when I heard Wharton, that that threw me off balance, right? <laughs> and then as as I, as I started going through these interviews, uh, I knew some. Of the What'd you expect? Elite boutique, man. They're they're interviewing the best of the best. What'd you expect? Right, right. <laughs> <clears throat> and to to clarify, right at that point, I didn't really know the difference between elite boutique and BB. I just I went on the vault, I think top fifty, and I knew that one of the banks, the bank that I was interviewing for, was among the top 20 right so it was yeah that was a selling point for me to pursue that opportunity but uh i I think at the end of the day you know bomb that interview i let uh the environment psych me out uh that was another so were you freezing like were you freezing when they were asking you technicals were you behaviorals were you stumbling like like babbling through that like where how did you how did you bomb it exactly (laughs) (laughs) i I think it was a combination of babbling and and having incongruencies in my narrative, even though that's the part I knew the best. Uh, mm. But I, I don't think it was so much about the technicals. I actually felt good about the technicals. It was more so on the on the narrative and the overall qualitative side. I was very nervous. Which is um, interesting, man, because you, know, you like you nailed, it was like the reverse on all the other ones. Like your technicals right, killed you. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> So there, there was one point, and this is this is an experience I'd never had before. I had, uh, I think, the head of the group and one MD come in and do a joint interview, and I had never done one of those before, right? Where it's a two-on-one, mm-hmm. especially when you have someone so senior as an MD and a head of the group interviewing yeah. you. Yeah, intense. I was sweating. I was freezing. Um, <laughs> but that was that was another great learning experience, right? I I started to realize that when you're at these super days, I mean, it, it's a level playing field right i mean you both are there it's really about who showcases to be more competent who has the best narrative um so moving forward i I carried that with me right like if i was if i was in your shoes man if i had only seen one other person at super day i'd be jumping up and down your odds are so good like (laughs) right i I would expect to see the wharton kid like you know you know i'm surprised that that threw you i'm but okay continue so you you didn't expect it to be so strong the the background to be so strong so it's kind of like it psyched you out you had these two on one did they play good cop bad cop or were they both nice no they did play the whole good cop bad cop and they did they did that yeah they did do that (laughs) And and i forgot how the question was phrased but something to the effect of why should we consider you when we have an Ivy League kid waiting outside. But come on, you got to be ready for that, man. (laughs) Right, right, right. And I, you know, I had read about that. I had seen that question. Yeah. I hadn't really prepared for it. I I thought it wasn't something that was going to be brought up, and it was brought up, and that threw me off guard. Um, I don't remember what my response was, right? But overall, the the big takeaway for me was uh, competition is going to be tough. Mm -hmm. Number two, just focus on executing and telling your story and communicating your competency. And the rest will fall into place. Um, okay. So I carried that with me in the in the last two super days I had. Uh, I think the the third super day I had, um, you know, it was more so of a fit mismatch. There wasn't anything significantly wrong with the way I interviewed or with the people there. I think just when you know there's a mismatch in culture, there's just a mismatch, right? And it's pretty evident. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think that was the, the biggest. Uh, reason as to why that didn't work out and then finally the the final super day with a middle market firm in new york uh, that worked out it was it was a group of seven people seven or eight people for the super day mm-hmm. and there was only one rule uh, and it was funny right because it was almost like i i remember that lesson from the warden kids so vividly in terms of you know staying within my zone, really focusing on my delivery and my execution. Yep. And the minute I get out the elevator to go to this final super day, 
um, you know, I step out of the elevator, I, I see some kid there, and I'm like, hey, you're here for the interview with so-and-so. He's like, yeah. I'm like, where are you from? He's like, Harvard. And in my mind, I'm like, all right, listen, you knew coming out here, the competition was going to be tough. Yeah. Focus on executing, focus on communicating your story, and you'll be fine. Um, so, you know, the odds were against me in terms of having seven or eight different people there. Yeah. Uh, having there been one one offer, one role being extended, and I secured that offer. Um, happy to talk a little bit more about that here today and what some of the, the new elements I found uh, during the interview yeah, process. Yeah, please. A- any, any more uh, good cop, bad cop, or surprises? <laughs> um, no good cop, bad cop. Uh, one of the MDs was really grilling me on my, my actual resume, my, the actual paper, meaning, uh, okay, this is your, your GPA. What, uh, what grade did you get in accounting? What grade did you get in finance? What grade did you get in ma- micro and macroeconomics? Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about this line right here. It was really just grilling the CV that I had. How was your, um, how was so your GPA, the, just out of curiosity? The GPA, yeah, the GPA was a 3.4. Okay. So yeah, so you, man, you're non-target, not even a super high GPA and you're like, yeah, I can't even believe you're in that seat. Right, That's what the right. guy's thinking. Um, like, why are you I, even here? So he's just going to grill you. For sure. And I okay. think what sold well was the extensive internship experiences that I had Yep. Uh, along with the extracurriculars and really everything I had done outside of school. Um, but yeah, anyways, so that was one element that I hadn't encountered before that I found interesting. I don't know what the motivation is for that tactic. Mm-hmm. It was fun. I walked him through every, every question he had. And then there was a case study that I had never ran into before. It was something along the lines of, um, you know, tell me how many restaurants there are in New York city. Here's a map of the city. Yeah, sizing uh, case. It's a consulting know, sizing case typically. Yeah. Yeah, it was like yep. a market size in case, if yep. you will. And I've never done one of those. Yeah. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, it's like every other guy says, right? They're more interested in identifying what your train of thought is and what type of framework you use, as opposed to coming up with the correct answer. Um, so went through that, felt pretty comfortable. Um, nothing else uneventful. So I, oh, there was actually one last moment that I wanted to mm-hmm. uh, to share. Um I was interviewing with one of the associates on the team and she's like, Hey, you know, walk me through, uh, through this paper DCF, right. Give me all the, all the inputs. I, I was working the numbers out and I, in the middle of the DCF calculation or, or running that model, she walks around, you know, gets up from her seat, walks behind me and it's just over my shoulder watching me while I'm doing this paper DCF. <laughs> Um, oh my God! I was fine. I was fine with that. I had done so many of them that I, I felt prepared, and it was almost like uh, an autopilot reaction, if you will, that I was going through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I, I would just communicate, expect that, right? There are going to be so many high duress, uh, stressful moments during interviews, and I think that's pretty pretty in line with how the role is. Um, so just be prepared for that, right? I think preparation and overall keeping a, a cool head is very important. Yeah, I think all those hours of, of prep you had done in your room started paying off in those moments when you have a, a, a kind of outside distraction. She's like trying to psych you out or stand over you right. while you're doing it. <laughs> and or like you have a good cop, bad cop, the guy's drilling you on your resume. You knew every single line by heart. You knew everything. So yeah. like it, it, it was kind of like you could overcome. And sometimes I would, I'd encourage people when you're going through these interviews, sometimes you think it's going really badly because the person's just being a jerk across the table. Yep. But if you just keep your cool and your composure and you just answer the questions and you stay positive, um, it doesn't mean you have to be like, oh, hunky dory, super positive when they're being super nasty and negative to you. But it, you know, sure. you, you don't need to be nasty back or flipping back. You just keep your professionalism and composure and, you know, be positive and, and kind of move forward. I think that's that yeah. oftentimes they, they'll leave and they'll be like, I like that kid, you know, um, it, it, it'll surprise you. Um, cool. So, okay. So this is great. So you, man, one out of seven, you're up against Harvard kids. You're up against some pretty tough competition. Obviously they're probably very polished as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they were. And what made you think you got the, I mean, I'm still surprised you got it. You know, to be honest, uh, that would surprise me. I would say, even if you were polished, it, you were kind of were, were going up against such a, such a, unlikely chance to get that one offer what, what do you think was the difference was it just it all came together on that day what do you feel like you were lucky uh you know i remember 
one moment in between all the all the candidates swapping rooms and you know meeting different people. I remember one of the one of the senior analysts coming out. He's like, "God, if that Harvard kid says Harvard one more time, I'm going to lose my shit." <laughs> right, and I, at that moment, I, I just thought to myself, "I'm like, stay grounded, mm-hmm. continue executing the way you have, and like things are going to work out." Right, I, I think one of the unspoken rules of interviewing or really exa- examining candidates is you want to work with someone that is just uh, normal, right? And what I mean by that is, yeah. Everyone in the industry is going to be intelligent and competent and capable and it comes from a great background, but you need that humane and uh, just grounded uh, touch, right? And not, not only in inter- interviewing, but the way you conduct business and the way you interact with all, of, all your other teammates. I think that's pretty important from a, a fit perspective. Yeah, they call it the airport test. Can you have a beer with this the person? Test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be... Uh... Are you going to enjoy your time when you're when you're delayed at the airport with this person? So okay, so great. So you were likable. the The Harvard kid was dropping Harvard too many times. um, Kind of came across the wrong way. You knew he was he was gone, but you still had other other people to to beat out. So just incredible that you made it. Um, So you you get that job. um, You have a great senior year, I assume. Oh yeah, enjoyed it. Did uh, sure was a blast. Breaking Cabo, had nice. a great time. I mean, still did well in school. Was still working, but it was a, a relief, right? Just going totally. into graduation knowing that you already have a job that you're very excited about that you worked very hard to get. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's an undescribable feeling, and I think especially coming from a foreign country, you know, it's funny speaking to to my my mom about it she thought i was going to be a financial advisor really some type of teller it's always funny and interesting trying to explain to your parents what you're doing right unless you're in they're like can you give me a stock pitch (laughs) 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 right oh you're an investment investment banking analyst okay um very cool so okay so you start um and then you know we won't get too much into it but for some there were some personal reasons you had to actually you didn't finish your full two years there um and can you can you tell me a little bit about when people when you're kind of faced with the a reality whether it's a personal situation thing where you have to um, either step away from the job for a while how you approach that because uh, you know I don't want to get too much into your background but um, you know um, you you basically were were forced to to forced to leave right not on, not on not the bank didn't force you but the but your own personal situation correct right. Um, Can you talk you know, to me a little bit about that? Take, sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so many elements, right? And I want to be thoughtful about how I communicate this, but I guess I, I want to begin with some of the takeaways and then I can dive a bit more into the, the intricacies and some of the details. But one of the takeaways is, you know, a lot of people that go into their investment banking careers on average are going to be very young. Uh, and this is going to be a small blip of what people's careers are, are going to become, right? So even if you have to step away for a year or, for, or a few months or you have to go uh, undertake another role, it's not the end-all, be-all, right? There's still various ways to break back into the industry. I think I'm a great case study of you know, leaving the industry, joining a startup, uh, a no-name startup in SF and you know, within a corporate development capacity and making my way back to New York within – a large bank, um, I think that's a great case study of people think it's over once you leave. But I want to communicate that that's not the case. Um, and item number two, I would just say be be proactive in everything you're doing uh, during that transition period and after, right? What I mean by that is continue making yourself uh, competent, whether it be through online remote, remote courses, any certifications, you know, whether it be CFA or Uh, anything else that might make sense. Um, Mm -hmm. Just being very proactive and staying as close to the ecosystem as possible, that I think plays out very well, or at least it did during my experience. Um, But happy to answer any other questions you have about the transition or really the transition back to New York. Yeah, I mean, I think there's different reasons, um, whether it's health of a loved one, your own personal health, um, whether anything, you know, it can be um, just other reasons as well, like, you know, death in the family, anything that could cause you to need to take some time to help your, your family. And so like when you're faced with that, I think, well, first off, you have a good reason, right? So it makes it a little bit easier kind of coming back in, right? 
um, when, right. you're, when you're telling people like what happened. Um, I had another podcast interview, actually a guest who, um, whose mother, um, he had a, he had a leave to help. Um, but he basically had no problem at all. Like, and they, they kind of made him a, an offer of terms of like, Hey, you can either like, we'll pay you out for the rest of the year they, they were very generous with him. Did you find that was the case wow. with, with your bank? Like, did they say, Hey, your seat is still here. Um, if you want to come back or was it more like, Hey, you go do your thing. Don't worry about it. Or what was kind of the, the communication there? Like what's... I didn't receive, I'm sure. I didn't receive the support that I hoped I would receive. Mm-hmm. Um, which is okay. Right. It varies bank to bank. Of course. And, yep. I think these things are unpredictable, but um, yeah, there there wasn't much support. I tried exploring other options. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, is there a possibility of joining another product or coverage group in uh, California that might make sense? Yeah. Uh, can can I stay within the company in a, a different capacity? Is is there optionality to uh, work re- more remotely throughout the week than actual FaceTime? Right. I, I explored every other avenue there was to potentially having me stay within the organization. Yeah. Uh, nothing made sense. And there were a lot of obstacles and roadblocks. I, I think more so from a company infrastructure and, and bureaucracy perspective. Well, to be fair, okay. where you, you were at, a, if, to be fair, you were at a top um, boutique, right? So like they, they kind of, ex- they're going to expect you to work long hours, be there. You know what I mean? You can't. For like, sure. None of these places are going to let you work remotely. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? It's just, right. it's not reality. So they're probably like, no, that's not happening. Um, I'm surprised they did. They weren't open to letting you work, work in a different office or like they didn't actually have, try to help that. But anyways, so you, you, at least when you left, you had like, you you knew that potentially you could get back when the time, back in when the time was right. Is that when you took this other kind of corp dev job, were you thinking like, for sure, I want to get back eventually? Or is it, was it a thought of, Hey, this is this other corp dev job might actually be interesting and I'll see what happens. Or was it just like a stopgap? Yeah, it was, it was a twofold, right? One, I found the work very interesting. I found it to be a good platform where I could expand on different skill sets that had been underutilized historically throughout my experiences. Mm -hmm. And on the other front, I I think I was a bit pessimistic, right? Wow, I worked my entire academic career and I did X, Y, and Z, and I went through so many super days to be able to get here, and now it's all gone. Yeah. Right, I I think it was a very tough moment in my career where I thought it was over. I thought, hey, I'm going to join this corp dev role and my only chance at rebranding is going to be through an an MSF or through an MBA. Uh, I thought it was over. Um, But, you know, I stayed active throughout my transition, throughout my other role. And I focused on giving the new role by everything and really getting the backing of every single individual within that organization. Mm -hmm. Um, And when the opportunity came, I, I was prepared i felt comfortable i was in a good state of mind i was refreshed it, it, it was a good uh restart right i think being an investment banking everyone knows how uh, stressful and how draining it can be so it was a good reset for me not only physically right to get back into the gym and, mm-hmm. and to healthy eating habits but to clear clear my mind um so i think i was at a perfect state to capitalize on this new opportunity here in new york yeah and you ended up at a bulge bracket so it's kind of a Interesting, you know, you left a boutique and kind of an unexpected, un- unfortunate circumstance, and you had to come back, and you ended up at a great place. So it's, um, it's kind of a, a great story, I think, you know, and and you know, one that hasn't hasn't fully been written yet. Um, but yeah, I, I think before we wrap up, anything else you'd like to share with with the listeners before we call the pod? You know, I, I would just say overall preparation is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's so many talented individuals out there that come from Ivy League backgrounds, but this is more geared towards, uh, you know, the non-targets, the ones that think that they don't have an opportunity. Uh, Use me as a case study and all the other individuals that have done so. Breaking in is possible. It takes a lot of work and commitment, and it's, you know, no walk in the park, but it's very feasible. And I, I learned that through all the experiences I had. Just focus on preparation uh, I think there has to be a bit of luck involved, but being active, proactive, and being prepared um, can position you very well. That's awesome, man. Well, I think we'll end on that, and really thank you for taking the time. 
And thanks to you, my listeners at Wall Street Oasis. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to send them my way, patrick at wallstreetoasis.com. Until next time. <laughs>